Violence against women takes many forms. Acid burning, honor killings, genital mutilation, beating, and rape. In South Asia, 43% women face violence. But don't think, even for a minute, that it happens only in South Asia. Let me give you some more statistics. In North America, it's 21%. In Europe and Central Asia, it's 29%. Latin America and the Caribbean, 33%. And Africa and the Middle East, 40%. And all these shocking figures understate the incidence of violence for two reasons. First, most of them refer exclusively to violence against women which are perpetrated by intimate partners. And second, most of the cases go unreported. I never thought it could happen to me. Me, who was teaching at the most renowned university in Dhaka, Bangladesh? until it did. I was born and raised in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I grew up with a brother not knowing that different rules applied for boys and girls. Then I got married. And for the first time, I came to know the invisible rules that taught me to silently tolerate all sorts of injustice in my marriage. From the very beginning, my husband was both physically and mentally abusive. For that reason, I never lost focus on my education. I always knew I have to create my own identity. I thought of divorce several times, but I did not have the courage or strength to face the social stigma. Anushe, my daughter. Anushe is the only good thing that came out of that brutal marriage. After I became a mother, I had to find a balance between my career and motherhood. To develop a successful career, I came to the University of British Columbia for higher studies. I started my master's program in August, so September 2010. And in May 2011, I went back to Bangladesh to collect data for my thesis and bring my daughter back to Vancouver with me. At that point, I was totally determined to get divorced. June 5. 2011 at around 3 15 in the afternoon I still remember it was a very hot and humid day I didn't know the next 15 minutes is going to change my life completely I was working on my laptop in my parents bedroom the TV was turned on quietly and my back was facing the bedroom door. My parents were not home. My ex-husband came by and the cook had let him in. He entered my parents' bedroom quietly, locked the door from inside and turned up the TV volume. To my surprise, I found him standing right behind me, but it was too late. He grabbed my hair and dragged me onto the bed. He sat on my chest and strangled me. He repeated again and again that he was going to kill me. 
I tried my best to release myself and then he took a bite out of my right forearm. When I still did not stop, he put both his thumbs deep into my eyes and moved them left and right, trying to gouge my eyeballs out. To my horror, I realized I can't see anything anymore. And then I felt his head was coming towards my face. He bit off the tip of my nose. I started bleeding. I, felt, I felt that I was getting weaker, but that wasn't the end of the madness. He dragged me off the bed onto the floor and started hitting me with whatever he could find. Some were blunt, some were sharp. Mercifully, the cook must have guessed something. She got help and opened the bedroom door. I still remember her scream. They found me in a pool of blood. My ex-husband threatened me that he would find me and kill me and run away. I survived that attack, but I never saw the world again. I never saw my daughter again. I want to see you all today, but I can't. What I see now is darkness. One month after that attack, I returned to Vancouver, British Columbia, and my return was possible only because of the relentless efforts of my friends at St. John's College and the university administration. They went out of their way to bring me and my family back to Vancouver. Upon my arrival, I was taken directly to the hospital. I went through four eye surgeries and a nose reconstruction. That's why you don't see a hole in my face now. I vividly recall the day when my doctor came to see me and gave me the most horrific news of my life. He sat next to my bed, held my hand, and told me the internal bleeding damaged the tissues inside my eyes so badly that there was nothing they could do to bring my sight back. I was shattered. I was devastated because until that moment, each day, I was only living with the hope that I would be able to see again. I was scared because I didn't know how to live as a blind person. I didn't know if it was possible to continue living. When I was struggling with these scary thoughts, he told me, you know, Romana, you will be able to do everything, but in a different way. Maybe they won't give you a driver's license. And maybe art exhibitions won't be your top priority and you have to give up photography. That made me laugh. And for the first time after that incident, I thought, maybe it's, it was possible. Let's give it a try. I took time to decide what would be my next step. 
how could I forget that I had the responsibility of my daughter? In January 2013, I decided I won't let anyone else decide how I'm going to live the rest of my life. I decided to take control of my life. I told myself, happiness and sorrow, they're just chemicals playing with your brain. And I want to be the chemist who would control those chemicals. Whenever I ask myself again and again the same question, why did I survive that day? Why didn't I die? Why am I still living? The only answer that came to me was, maybe there is a reason. Maybe I need to be a voice for those hundreds of millions of women who are suffering in silence, who does not have any access to any power, who does not have any privileges. That realization made me stronger. That realization gave me a purpose. Also, my duty as a mother did not let me look back and lock myself in a corner. I finished my master's degree. I wrote one of the hardest and brutal exams in my life, the law school admission test, and started law school. I won't pretend it's easy to live like this. Sometimes I just feel I'm fighting a lost battle. I don't even remember how I overcame those initial hurdles. Maybe it was trust that I have in humanity. Maybe it's power that I possess as a human being, the best creation of the Almighty. Maybe it's unlimited love that I have received from my family, my friends, and many people around the world who didn't even know me but showered me with their love, support, and blessings. Even now, each day I face many challenges. But my motivation to overcome those challenges is my desire to live a meaningful life. I envision a world which is free of violence against women. I know we all do, but how can we do that? Firstly, we must raise awareness about violence against women. We must hate it. We must hate it the way we all hate child prostitution, child pornography, and human trafficking. Only then we will be able to take action. Secondly, we must believe in our inner power and strength. That belief will give us the confidence to bring change. The confidence which is needed to challenge the existing structure that allows for systemic violence. Thirdly, we must intervene and fight for the victims. As Edmund Bark says, the only necessary thing for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I would replace good men with good people, though. We must remember, no religion, no culture advocates and tolerates injustice. I have lost my sight, but 
I have gained vision. My third eye has become more powerful and strong. What I have endured since June 2011 has prepared me for this journey. This is my starting point. If my friends, my family, the university administration accepted the attack on me as a mere consequence of the existing social evil, I wouldn't be here today. In my effort to fight this global social evil of violence against women, I am determined to play my part because I know I can make a difference. I know you can make a difference. And most of all, if we all try together, the social evil can be defeated. Will you join me?